to expect diversity in any institution means that you will sacrifice meritocracy. That is the sad bottom line equation right now. Given the academic skills gap, you can have meritocracy or you can have diversity. You cannot have both. And any institution that is telling you it's opting for diversity is telegraphing that it is jettisoned meritocracy. And that goes as well for medicine and for the sciences. Okay, I'm going to introduce Heather McDonald, whom I have admired for decades now. Uh, and I'm going to begin with an endorsement of her work. She's written many books, and they're about big subjects that are at the heart of the crisis of America, and they have been right from the beginning. And if you want to understand those subjects in the way you would to, to, to define precisely what are the issues and what are the main facts, there's no quicker or more reliable way to get that done than to read Heather McDonald. <laughs> so... Thank you so much, Dr. Arn. That's an extraordinary compliment and a, an absolute privilege to be with you. I, yes. I'm so grateful for this opportunity. Uh, so I want to talk about you first. You're an interesting woman. Eek. Uh, California girl, mm -hmm. and still, by yeah. preference, yep. we're in New York Believe right now. Yeah. At, uh, and you study literature, undergrad Yale and Cambridge. Tell, tell us about that. What did you learn from that? Was that good? And I loved language from at least high school. I was attracted in high school to the most uh, idiosyncratic writers as possible. So I loved Faulkner. I loved Melville for just using language in a way that is shattering of, of any kind of normal sense of the world. Today, I'm probably more in favor of greater clarity in writing uh, than, and a little less subjectivity. But still, I was always fascinated by questions of meaning, how language creates worlds. And so I stumbled into Yale uh, because it was very intellectual. It, I was attracted to its intellectual seriousness at the time. But it happened to be a period when Yale was dominant in the field of literary theory uh, and was the epicenter in the United States for something known as deconstruction and post-structuralism. So I sadly wasted way too much of my time on literary theory, but I did have the privilege of reading the greatest books in the English literature tradition. Mm. So my freshman year, uh, my English 25 class, which was a prerequisite to being a major. We started with Chaucer, and then we read Edmund Spencer, The Fairy Queen, and Milton, uh, and moved through the 18th century Augustan period Pope, and eventually into the uh, Romantics. I wrote my senior thesis under Jeffrey Hartman on, on Wordsworth's Prelude, and ended with Wallace Stevens. And um, mm. it was an extraordinary experience. I remember breaking down in tears trying to read Paradise Lost for the first time by Milton because the syntax was so damn complicated. And I, having not gone to Hillsdale, didn't try to learn Latin until my senior year of college. And it was too late by then. For all of your, <laughs> your, your, your adult learners that are doing Hillsdale, if you're struggling with Latin, believe me, I'm sympathetic to you. Because um, I did other languages fine, but Latin broke me. But I I was terrified that I would not be able to master Milton's syntax and was reassured eventually that I would by my senior, by my professor. Uh, and, and that opened up to me just the richness of the language, the gorgeousness of his description of paradise. You've, and it's like Shakespeare's scenes in Midsummer Night's Dream, the fairy language, the gold, the green... To me, this is the greatest privilege of learning, of being able to wallow in beauty created by language. And now, now that I've thrown off the deconstructive poison, what I read for is human insight. Mm. To understand human worlds and human psychologies that 
would otherwise be completely foreign to me and I would never have that experience of. So you're implying a connection between beauty and truth. Well, I I am enough of a deconstructionist still that I'm not certain about truth, except when I'm writing. I'm I'm a hypocrite because when I'm writing about policing, say, I know there is a truth about crime and policing and whether police are racist. As a philosophical matter, though, I'm not quite certain about that. Uh, but yes, when I'm reading something, beauty does bring me close to certainly an experience of the sublime and of what human beings are capable of, the most profound and sensitive human beings that we as mediocrities can experience vicariously briefly. Uh, but yes, I, I would say that George Eliot certainly tells us something very true about the enormous difficulties of marriage and the way men and women project their own desires onto each other and sometimes blind themselves to the reality of the other person and and tells us something true about the structure of 19th century villages and political and religious life so yes as a as an experience of living of course i believe in truth yeah well good marriage is a beautiful i claim having one but uh and you can you, you can't understand them without understanding the evils that make them not good when they're not good. What is the beginning of war and peace? Every every Anna Karenina, every family is every happy family is happy happy in its own way. I may get that backwards. Yeah, unhappy, unhappy, and it's in the same way. Okay, that's good. And uh, the reason I'm interested in that is because one of my teachers was a lit major at Yale, as were you, and he never got over that. Harry Jaffa was his name, and he taught Shakespeare like nobody, Aristotle too. But um, I see that in your work. Uh, your, your, your gift is clarity. Uh-huh. Thank and, you. And then precision. And uh, you seem to know what it is to dispose of a question. So people will find great benefit in reading your books. And I think the best of them may be recently published. We'll talk about that. Um, now, there's a complex of things that you've written about. Uh, they all have to do with race, uh, law enforcement, immigration, uh, merit. Mm -hmm. uh, merit, would you say, so your, your latest book is called, state the title because I'll misstate it, but it's called uh, When Race it. Trumps Merit. When Race Trumps Merit. I think that that's the, a culmination of your career so far. Thank you. I think you've been defending merit. Yeah. I don't think you've ever been defending any race against any other race, your own included. I think you're standing up for merit. Now, why is that important? Yeah, I find that an amazing question. I've been asked that in podcasts. Well, tell us why merit is important. And I'm not faulting you for asking it, but I think Americans have become a little bit uh, lazy in the way they think about things, that they think that they can cast objective judgments about qualifications, academic qualifications, knowledge aside, and think that they can continue with the extraordinary benefits of Western civilization that has, those benefits came from our awareness that there is such a thing as human excellence. There are differences in what people know. Uh, there's people who have more expertise than others, and we should be unapologetic about rewarding the attainment of knowledge and creating an incentive for young people to reach their fullest potential rather than telling one group of people that they are perpetually victims and can only succeed by having standards lowered on their behalf and telling another group of people that they are going to face barriers uh, and will not be allowed to 
to go forward with their maximal skills because they're the wrong race and, and sex. But it's interesting, you're absolutely very perceptive, Dr. Arn, because I started out a, a liberal by default, growing up in the coastal elite cultures of, of Los Angeles and then and then, you know, the Ivy Leagues and prep schools, and uh just absorbed certain instincts without really thinking about them. And I was not politi- particularly political, but but still, that's just the air you breathe. But I was always opposed to racial preferences. Even when I was justifying having my lovely British Holdsworth bike stolen from the Yale Law School, which I'd brought back from Cambridge because I had a vague intuition that it was probably black kids in New Haven who sold, stole it, stole it, and th- they deserved it and I didn't. So I was apologizing for for violence, for the destruction of property, but I always hated preferences because to me, it's just clear that we need to reward excellence and, and vilifying excellence is, is both unfair to the individual who is being held back because he doesn't fit the preferred categories, uh, but it's also suicidal as a society. Okay. So I have to, I have to come back to this, but I think you just said a big thing uh, in, in, in this recent book. Um, you think that death, the death of civilization itself is at stake, at stake here. Yeah, I don't want to be hyperbolic, but I see every single day that everything is coming down. Everything. I, I, you know, people, I don't expect people to be following it the way I am, but I can just give you a report from the field that every single day, somebody in STEM, somebody in medicine, sends me a report from his field of the latest scientific journal to declare science and math racist because they have a disparate impact or somebody in classical music uh, sending me the latest manifesto from a symphony orchestra or an opera company saying that the inheritance of Western classical music is racist. Somebody we see in the news, it does get covered that the latest uh, gifted and talented program is torn down because of disparate impact. It is all coming down unless we gain the courage to speak the truth and say stand neutral colorblind standards are not racist. Mm. See, all men are created equal. Uh, yep. I want to talk about classical music. Yeah. You've recommended a man to me, and I've gotten to know him now, John McLaughlin I'm Williams. I'm so glad. He's doing some work at Hillsdale College. Yeah. And, uh, He's a violinist and a conductor. Now, he rebelled. He happens to be African-American, but he doesn't like all this picking them by their color. Are you a musical person yourself? I grew up playing the piano, yes. And I was fortunate enough that my father took my family to the Los Angeles Philharmonic uh, on Sunday afternoons for their matinee concerts at the Dorothy Chandler Pavilion, which... Now has sort of been superseded by the by the Gary Building uh, downtown, but um, yes, I, I and my father played the piano much much better than I did. So I grew up hearing him play the the Chopin Scherzi, which are po- totally beyond my skill. Uh, there was something a great thing I was thinking about this today because as I was leaving to have our interview. Uh, the classical music station in New York, WQXR, was playing the Schumann Piano Concerto. And my father played, there was something called Music Minus One, where you would get an LP recording that would be the orchestral part or the rest of a chamber music part, and you would play the solo. So he he was able to play the Schumann Piano Concerto. And I remember hearing that with the, the recording, and he also did a Haydn string trio, a piano trio, um, so I view myself as incredibly privileged to have had that music in my ears for a very long time. Mm. I had a lawyer friend, a uh, DC lawyer named Lou Cowder, a really great man. And, uh, he was a clarinetist and he played those music minus one Did he concerts. really? Oh, how funny. Yeah. Yeah. And he, I, I heard him play one in his basement one time. Oh wow! Well, mm-hmm. I was wondering what the current iteration of it is, because obviously there's a problem because the orchestral part is going to be 
rote and rigid. So I'm wondering if today with IT or something, you could have an orchestra that would be a little more supple and responding to your own playing. So it would be interactive, but who knows? I mean, classical music is tragically so sidelined in our culture that I don't know if there'd be the resources to and create something like that. I, I, the reason I'm, I'm talking about this is, first of all, it's very arresting to me that in this book, you have a long section about classical music. Mm -hmm. And uh, as, as is typical of you, you've hit upon something. Because uh, I learned one time, we have, we have a lot of music at Hillsdale College, and I believe in it very much, and we've got, we're good at it. 40% of our kids are participating in music somewhere, somewhere or another. Fantastic. And uh, I learned from one of the show pony musicians and teachers at Hillsdale that uh, if you get a job in a big orchestra, you audition. Yep. And there might be 40 other people. And the people deciding who's going to get it never see you. Mm -hmm. You sit behind a screen. Right. It's colorblind. And yet, and that means that, you know, I, I, I know a man named Grant Llewellyn, who was the yes. uh, director of the North Carolina Symphony, may, may still be, and also one of the BBC orchestras. And he's a Welshman, attractive man, also was a high-class soccer player. In in Wales, uh, he and I, I went to one of his concerts, and I had lunch with him the day after. And we got to talking about music at Hillsdale College. And I said, uh, he, he said, I said, yeah, we have a lot of music. And he said, what's your orchestra like? And I said, well, it's doubtless not as good as yours, but it's bigger. <laughs> and I said, also, I said, when they get a standing ovation. They're not whispering to each other about where they're going to get a drink after the concert. And he went, ouch. <laughs> and I said, and I said uh, he said, I'd like to come. So he came and conducted our orchestra and spent a few days with us. And he's very, and, and I, and I, for some reason, because he was delightful, because he's a highly skilled man, how objective is it, the good musicians? How, how well can you tell? And the point is, you can tell. Immediately. You know. In the first 15 seconds, you can tell. Yeah. And that means that this, this whole thing. So, in, in, and, and so this is an excellent microcosm yep. of a theme of your life. Yep. I mean, I'm going to be very blunt, Dr. Arn. This is not a universally true but we are caving to what is, in fact, a race hustle. Yeah. It is. And we have to say no to it. We have to be, I'm not going to be cowed by being called a racist. Not everybody in the classical music world or any other world, you mentioned John McLaughlin Williams. I adore him. But there are black classical musicians who are going around now making an incredibly good career of claiming that they've been the victims of discrimination in classical music. It's patently false. Yeah. I mean, some of these guys, Anthony McGill, clarinetist, I, I know these other uh, wind players, brass players who say, it's unbelievable what this guy is doing. He's been given every opportunity. The classical music has embraced black performers for decades, creating, uh, you know, special programs to get instruction, special fellowships. They're reaching out, and yet there's a bunch of opera singers and classical musicians who are going around saying that they've been discriminated against. It's false, but the commissions are rolling in. They're be being granted like DEI positions in orchestras, which is a complete waste of money. It's just a fraud. Uh, and But nobody has the capacity, it seems, at this point to say, however tragic and and terrifying our history was, however cruel, gratuitously nasty we were to blacks in the past, something that is extremely difficult to reconcile with our ideals and and needs to be, I think, constantly remembered, we are not that country today. The reality today is black privilege. It is not white privilege. Every institution, whether it's a classical music organization, a law school, a law firm, a big tech firm, is twisting itself into knots 
to try to hire and promote as many blacks as possible, and white heterosexual males are at the bottom of the heap. We that's our reality, and yet we will not say it. Mm. So uh, this is so good because it's you know forty people trying to get a job, and the people who pick them can't see them, and right. yet they can reach a consensus. In right. other words, I I don't know of any test of merit clearer than that one. Right. And now, step back a step. And I, I'm in the kid business, and I think I have learned what's good for them. Mm-hmm. What do they need? They want to grow. If you tell them that they can't grow of their own, because of some ancillary thing, or if you tell them that what it is to grow is arbitrary, you deprive them of the reason to strive. And that's what's demoralizing and right. devastating about this. And, you know, if the orchestras don't sound as good anymore because of this, most of us won't know it. Well, at some level we will. But if everything goes that way, right? And one of the most amazing lies on non Hillsdale College campuses today, that this incredible sleight of hand that they're allowed to get away with, is that on the one hand, they will say to the Supreme Court and everybody else who's listening, if you don't allow us to continue with racial preferences, we will be fatally non diverse. Racial preferences are the absolute essential criterion of our admission system because otherwise we will not be able to engineer the requisite critical mass of black students. So they're quite explicit about that. Then they turn around and if you make any judgment about any particular black student that as a statistical matter, not, you know, just On average, given what we've been told about the incredible necessity of preferences, there's a good chance that you're here because of a racial preference. That is bigoted. Mm -hmm. And we're supposed to pretend that those preferences do not exist uh, and that this is some colorblind system. And, And everybody goes around pretending that there are not skills gaps and that the only reason that they're not exact proportionality in some schools of 13% black students is discrimination. (laughs) It's a really remarkable thing when we know that colleges are begging and demanding and are now going to be violating the law inevitably in order to continue racial preferences because they want blacks there so very much. And yet at the same time, you have Yale's Peter Salovey, the president, or the president of, of Princeton, Christopher Eisgruber, beating their chest and saying, woe is me, I preside over a racist institution. They would rather, these, these, these cowardly, craven college presidents would rather accuse their own institutions, implicitly they would rather accuse their own faculty and administration's officers of discriminating against blacks than being honest with the American people we have a problem. This academic skills gap is huge. It's not closed. And to expect diversity in any institution means that you will sacrifice meritocracy. That is the sad bottom line equation right now. Given the academic skills gap, you can have meritocracy or you can have diversity. You cannot have both. And any institution that is telling you it's opting for diversity is telegraphing that it is jettisoned meritocracy, and that goes as well for medicine and for the sciences. Hmm. What do you do about that gap? Do you need to do something about it? What would what would fix it? Well, I get asked this a lot, and I'm, I will sometimes say it's we. It's not up to us any longer, the we being taken as sort of the greater society, and I'm going to be very blunt, uh, whites. We have been trying to close that gap for six decades. We've tried liberal explanations and solutions. We've tried conservative solutions. They've made very little difference. 
we can continue. We should continue with that. Certainly conservatives should continue or start <laughs> would start would be a good thing. Not apologizing for colorblind standards that have a negative disparate impact on blacks. But frankly, my belief at this point is the change has to come within the black culture above all else. It's a it's a theory because I have this opinion about how young people grow. And I have the opinion that it doesn't have to do with their color. It has to do with the nature of their souls. Then I wonder why is it harder for some? Well, uh, Shelby Steele and Tom Soule and Clarence Thomas, all very great people, they will tell you 50 years ago, the black family was one of the strongest institutions in America, and now it's weak. Other families are collapsing too now. And, you know, I start charter schools, reform schools, schools run a different way. Uh, they're good. They're different. The public schools tend to uniformity, but they tend to very low quality in low income areas. And that's because I think, first of all, the bureaucracy in the schools, writ large across America, now outnumbers the teachers. Mm -hmm. And that means decisions are made outside the classroom. And they tend to be made for the benefit of the people who work outside the classroom. And so those schools are not great. Now, there are many examples of great inner city schools where they really learn. But it's less common than in other places. Uh, so one thing to do about it would be to liberate education in those areas. Uh, that's so. I'm, well, yes. and. I would say absolutely. Uh, <laughs> of course, we're also tearing down and making teacher licensing exams mediocre because they have a disparate impact on blacks. New York City just paid out its largest tort settlement ever, a billion dollars, uh, to black uh, adults who had tried several times to pass the New York State teacher's licensing exam and had failed. And the only allowable explanation in our culture today for any racial underrepresentation in any institution or the overrepresentation of blacks in criminal justice system is racism. That's the only allowable explanation. You are not allowed to say either skills gap when it comes to meritocratic institutions or criminal offending gap when it comes to criminal justice. So, so a bunch of a big class action. The teacher licensing exam must be racist because blacks were not passing it at the same rate as whites. And so we got rid of the exam. We watered it down. Uh, and because nobody dared to say that maybe blacks coming into taking the score had lower skills to begin with, which as a factual matter, they do. 12, I, I you know, if you look at black 12th graders, 66% of black 12th graders in the United States do not possess even partial mastery of the most basic 12th grade math skills defined as arithmetic or reading a graph. 7% are proficient, and the number who are advanced in 12th grade math is too small to show up statistically. In reading, 50% of black 12th graders do not possess even partial mastery of basic 12th grade reading skills. This means, again, you can have diversity or meritocracy, you can't have both. That's why blacks weren't passing the teacher's licensing exam. But our explanation is racism. So we're throwing out teacher's licensing exams across the board. We're lowering their standards, watering them down. So yes, mm. skills, schools taught by teachers who know something would be a help. Schools without student-centered education. We were talking about this before the podcast of the preposterous idea that teachers are facilitators and students should determine their own, what they want to read and curriculum. But I would say, I'm sorry, Larry, I agree with you, but I would also add a caveat that there was a book written in the 1990s, I can't remember the exact title, about a woman who went to Oakland schools 
and she was Asian. Her parents had come, maybe Vietnamese fleeing some of the tyrannies in her country. And she went to a really lousy Oakland inner city school. Her par- her mother and her parents insisted that she study, that she take her textbooks home, that she she work for her exams. And she accomplished enough there to go on to college. Many of her peers from Oakland, from West Oakland, they grew up in a culture that stigmatized academic effort as acting white. So yes, the schools have to be better, but I am going to insist that the family culture has to say, you will take advantage of however lousy your school is, you're still going to take your textbook home and study, and you're not going to run the streets at night. There is a huge role for parental responsibility that is just not being met at this point. If uh, So there's that really great movie, The Lottery. Uh, there's another one called Waiting for Superman. Right. If, if our listeners have not watched that, I urge them to. Uh, the one I've seen is The Lottery. And the point is, it's about the Harlem success. I think they're both about the Harlem success academies. Yeah. And, you know, we're in New York right now. They're not that far from here. And they operate cheek by jowl with a bunch of public schools. And the story of the lottery is the families getting the kids ready to go for the day of the lottery. And the families are extended families. Grandma, uncle, aunt, mom, not dad all the time. And they're excited. Now, most of them are black. But they're excited, and they want to go, and they want to get. They get new blue jeans to go sit and take a and, and be entered into a lottery. Now the thing is, that is the impulse of people loving their offspring. Mm-hmm. If that's not reliable, nothing is. But don't we cut that out in the way we run the schools today? Because we have appointed a regulatory state to decide what the schools will be. Well, yes, certainly, but I would say we've that's been the status quo in public education in the United States for a long time. Mm-hmm. And the Jews and they were in a regulatory school and uh they had a family culture that emphasized more than with their peers that we expect you to excel and to go to the Ivy League. Now, I'm not going to promote the Ivy League, and I think far too many people go to college. Uh, we we demean very, at our peril, the beauty of physical labor, of figuring machines out. You know, a lot of guys want to tinker, and, and we're denying them that expression of their under, innate understanding of how things work in engineering. But, but, but we had students that came out of the American public school system when it did not have choice and did not have vouchers uh, with very strong academic skills. Now, we also, you know, there were better teachers. The, 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 one of the received wisdom, you know, stories about public education is there were a lot, the females that didn't get the same access to other skills were channeled into teaching and they it may have been a higher caliber it probably was of teachers the people with the lowest SATs and GREs are those who go into teacher ed it's yeah. really pathetic well it's more so I let me expand my father was a public school teacher in Pocahontas Arkansas I always say I was born rich we didn't have any money but my mom and dad liked to read books yep and they took care of each other and us and so that's, you know, a huge privilege in yep, life. Yep. And I was expected to do well in school. But yeah, what the thing is, a teacher, you know, I'm a teacher. I employ many teachers too. A teacher is a calling, is pursuing a calling of great dignity. If you look at the old Western movies, you know, when the cowboys go into school schoolhouse, they take their hats off. <laughs> and uh the great movie Liberty Valance. Uh, one man represents the law and another man represents the gun and the teacher represents wisdom. Who gets wisdom in the plot? The answer, the man who represents the law assisted by another man who gets the gun. 
But the prize is the teacher, the woman, and the wisdom. It's a very lovely movie. And uh, and uh, John Wayne plays the disappointed man who also loved the woman. He didn't get her. What he did was save the life of the man who brought the law book. So that structure of the society, that me- teachers to have dignity, they have to be symbols of wisdom. They have to know things, things that everybody wants to know, valuable things. Now what they are is people who've been taught techniques of getting across points that flow constantly from above, not expect- expected to possess great knowledge themselves, and that means it's not a good calling. You know, they like we use the term uh, for teaching delivery. Mm-hmm. We deliver now. We're delivery girls and boys. And that's why it's demeaned. Well, and the it, rot, you know, we were discussing this again before. It set in long, long ago with Dewey and progressive education that, that did uh, view the teacher as just a facilitator for student self expression and, 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 and paid less attention to the idea of there being, in fact, an objective body of knowledge that needs to be crammed into these students' empty noggins in the pathetically inadequate time of college, but much before that. But I I have to say, I fell in love with all my teachers at Yale. I really did, because to me, knowledge and Eros was the same thing. I yeah, They yeah. were a source of knowledge and therefore, for me, the object of Eros, because I yearned for that knowledge. Uh, and and some of them were absolutely deserving of that love. I think of Thomas Gould, who taught the Greek tragedies and comedies, and he conveyed the absolute terror of Aeschylus Oresteia, of the the movement of the, the, the choruses, the dancing, the masks, so you couldn't see their faces, uh, chanting on the stage, moving back and forth with the, the movement in each chorus, and confronting these human forces, chthonic human forces that are still with us, that are so dark, we can barely understand them. And he brought that world of the Greek festival of drama to life. Uh, And I fell in love with John Frichero, a Renaissance Dante scholar who was getting very involved in deconstruction, but still had knowledge of medieval literature, theology, and yes, that that to me is very attractive and and explains, you know, there's easy to abuse that power to the extent that students still have regard knowledge with yearning and love. It is easy for teachers to exploit that, you know, and they have to be very careful. Yeah. Uh, well, but see, that's and that, that that'll help me make my point. That was very good. What you just said. Everybody, everybody listen to that again. Um, <laughs> So those two professors that you just named, yes, they know that because they gave themselves to it. Mm-hmm. Men of immense talent, and their life is a service to that knowledge. Right. And I had said when we talked before that uh, a college professor in the classic sense is kind of like a monk. They give themselves to knowing things that most people don't know, and they become good teachers because they love the young and they want them to know the things. They want to help them. So, and decisively, it's not about them. Right. See, now, what John Dewey did was he turned the university into an engineering project. Our work is to divide ourselves into our disciplines and decide how to change the society Mm -hmm. to make it the way we want to. Now an exercise of power. Yeah. It's actually exactly like the argument between Socrates and the sophists, because they were the ones who taught the young men to be powerful. Mm -hmm. Rhetoric. And Socrates taught them to give themselves to the things that were to be known. Yep. So we, every, every school is an engineering school now. And because you've spoken so well about literature, that was very nice what you said, because see, I, I have perceived in, Heather McDonald for many years now, that she retains the love 
of the high things that moved her when she was a girl. Mm -hmm. And then she's fighting for those all the time. That's right. You see, she's never been fighting for her race or any other race. She's fighting for beauty and truth. And she's not as quick as I am to associate those two terms, but I'm working on it. <laughs> now, I want to go, we're going we're gonna to come back to this to close, but we have to make a, another departure now because uh, you've written a lot about law enforcement. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're not enforcing the law. Nope. And uh, talk about that a little bit. Uh, what is the effect of not doing that? And then I'll ask you, why are we not doing that? We've unleashed anarchy upon our cities. We are subjecting business owners to predation. We have given up on the basic obligation of civilization, which is to protect property. I actually think that the widespread looting that is going on in many, many American cities of on a daily basis. Statistically, it is known in New York City. Every single day, there will be hundreds of business owners who are stolen from. And yet, our mayor, Eric Adams, concerns himself with other things. As far as I'm concerned, when you know that as a statistical truth, that you are not protecting those business owners' expectations of security in their property you have no right to exist as a government, that that is even more shocking than the violence. It's strange to say, because obviously, if you're the victim of a violent crime, uh, that is life changing and is also a deprivation of some of your basic rights. But the ongoing assault and insecurity of property is really a, unbelievably corrosive. And this is an absolutely predictable result of the fact that we have decided that to enforce the law in a, or it, it's not that we decided, it is true. It is a truth that if we enforce the law in a neutral colorblind fashion, we will have a disparate impact on black criminals. Not because the law and the criminal justice system is racist, not because the police are racist or were white supremacist, but because the crime of rates are so much higher in the black community. And anybody who's looking around today and saying, what the heck is going on with these progressive prosecutors? It's Alvin Bragg in New York or George Gascon in Los Angeles or Kim Fox in, in Chicago, Larry Krasner in Philadelphia. Why aren't they, why have they decided to put off entire categories of crime are essentially decriminalized, so they're not going to enforce trespass or theft or fair beating, resisting arrest. If you don't understand race, you don't understand what's going on. It's all about race. If there were no racial disparities in criminal offending, our attitude would basically be lock them up and throw away the key. Nobody would be talking about mass incarceration. Mass incarceration is a euphemism for the fact that there are racial disparities. Let me give you again facts that are not allowed in the public sphere, Dr. Arn, because the only allowable explanation for any racial disparity, here's the rule, is racism. You're not allowed to talk about behavior. You're not allowed to talk about skills. When it comes to behavior, in the post-George Floyd race riot era, black juveniles are shot at 100 times the rate of white juveniles. Blacks between the ages of 10 and 24 die of gun homicide at 24 times the rate of whites in that same age cohort. <laughs> who's killing them and who's shooting them? Not the police, not whites, but other blacks. There is carnage going on on an unbelievable basis daily in inner cities. And the world and the press turns its eyes away because it's terrified that it doesn't know how to close those crime gaps. You had a great article, more than one, but you had a great article not so long ago about uh, death rates by cops in mm -hmm. Primus, our publication, yeah. which everybody can get if they want it. Uh, can you remember those numbers? How many people do cops kill in a year in America? Well, cops kill, it's been remarkably stable ever since the Washington Post started keeping track in 2015, 
which to me suggests that this is not some arbitrary number. It reflects the degree to which cops interact with violent, armed, and resisting suspects, because that's what predicts cop use of lethal force. If you don't want to get killed by a cop, here's a simple thing. Do not resist arrest. So every year the cops shoot fatally about a thousand people. A, a little over half of those are white. So about 52, 53, 55% are white and about 25 to 27% are black. So the Black Lives Matter activists, Al Sharpton and the mainstream media, CNN, MSNBC, they get their hands on that 25% number and they say, aha, racist criminal justice system because blacks are 13% of the nation's population. So they're being shot at about twice the rate. That's the wrong benchmark. Hmm. The question is, what is the black crime rate? And if you look at the 75 largest counties in the United States, which is where most of the population resides, blacks commit about 66% of all violent crime, though they're 15% of the population in those counties. So that means that here in New York City, for example, Blacks are 22% of the population. They commit about 75% of all drive-by shootings. Whites are 34%. They commit 1% to 2% of all drive-by shootings. Add Hispanic shootings to black shootings, you account for about 100% of all shootings in New York City. This has enormous consequences for policing. It means that virtually every time the police are called to a shots fired call, meaning somebody's been shot in one of these grotesque, barbaric drive-by shootings that have taken dozens of black children's lives since George Floyd. They are almost always being called to a scene, being given the description of a black suspect if anybody is, is cooperating with them for once and the victims are themselves black. That explains why blacks are shot more at a higher rate. Here's the other comparison though. A police officer is 400 times as likely to be killed by a black person as an unarmed black is to be killed by a police officer. Hmm. So libertarians like Radley Balco always go around saying, oh, policing is so safe. You know, it's just bathos. It's just this sickly, treacly, uh, you know, uh, sentimentality that says policing is racist, that doing a car felony car stop is really a safe activity. If it's safe to be a police officer in America, it's really safe to be an unarmed black vis-a-vis -a, -vis a police officer. Mm. So everything the public thinks it knows about policing, crime, and race from the mainstream media is a lie. Reverse it and you have the truth. Hmm. Awesome. Uh, now, strengthening the police at the national level, there are larger suspicions of law enforcement because of political involvement and FISA courts and partisanship in the FBI. What about all that? What do you think about all that? Well, that's dealing with sort of more abstract issues of, of the rule of law and the abuse of prosecutorial and investigative power on federal law enforcement. That's a very different matter than inner city policing, which is local police forces. And there you have cops that have been demoralized, emasculated by the national narrative that our president, Joe Biden and uh, President Obama before him, spend endless amount of time uh, reiterating, which is that black parents are right to fear that their children will be killed by a cop every time they go outside, when in fact, uh, you know, they, they're right. They're, they're at much higher risk of being shot, but it's because of other black criminals and other black juveniles. So the, but the larger discourse about, are we becoming a totalitarian state and do we trust our federal law enforcement agencies? Are they being politicized? That's a separate issue. And it's not, that's not an, a race issue. What's going on on with violent street crime and, and, and ubiquitous carjackings, mass lootings, you know, the, the flash mobs in Chicago beating up innocent whites, that's a race and policing issue. The larger question is a very worrisome one. And, uh, you know, this is something that is, you know better than I, that the universal aspiration of human beings is to be judged by neutral laws and neutral principles and to have faith 
that if they come before a tribunal of justice, they can hope that they are not going to be the victim of partisan passion, but can hope for a neutral arbiter. And if we lose that, if we believe that justice is partisan, then that that it's over as well for that. So that's an odd thing, you know, uh, and it's dangerous, I think, because at the local level, the cops are besieged. Right. And uh, at the national level, they're mistrusted. And I don't, I have, you know, I, I in general, I think that most of the ills of America, put the public ills, the political ills, most of them can be addressed by decentralizing things as they used to be. Mm -hmm. People ought to live their own lives. Yes. You know, the best accountability for schools is parents, uh, you know, stuff like that. And if you just do that, on the average, it'll go better than if you try to systematize and centralize it. And also that last thing will be very expensive. So I think most of it's like that. And then I'm tempted to think, although I'm not sure, that there's too much law enforcement in the federal level. Mm -hmm. I know that there should be counter espionage and national security stuff, but shouldn't you, and, and you know, there needs to be some things, I guess, that are, uh, that you have a national police force to deal with. But you know, if they live in Washington, D.C., they do get a, re, mixed up in politics a lot. And it's not just federal legislators, it's just this idea that they're doing something by, by, banning it or by regulating it, that this is some heroic action. You know, they'll, there's this amazing rhetoric that registration use of we've come together and we've solved this problem or we've, you know, we've exercised courage in doing this. Meanwhile, the business owner that is like being saddled with more and more regulations, he's the one that is actually being creative and is trying to put his own ego at risk by bringing goods or services into the stream of commerce and risk rejection and failure. And, and, and they get no credit or no respect whatsoever. And, and, and we believe that these legislators that are in this frenzy now of banning things, I mean, obviously we're not going to talk about the green energy and e electric vehicles, but they're involved in, I, I thought that the COVID policy was the worst public Fail, policy failure in American history, but I think it's going to be out outgunned by electric vehicle policies, where they are engaged in patently contradictory and impossible goals of sh of thinking that we're going to shut down all elect all all generation of electricity through fossil fuels and non renewables. It can't be done. The electric vehicle thing cannot be done, but they're doing it anyway. So yes, the the inebriation of power and believing that you are the driving force in society by legislating and regulating is way out of control. Obviously, we need laws, but 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 people have gotten drunk on their own power. It's like some symphony. Too many notes. Too, <laughs> too, too many laws. <laughs> to, not, not Mozart. No, that's right. That's in that thing, isn't it? Okay, I want to go back. So your your recent book, yeah. and I encourage everybody to read read them all because they're good. Um, it has uh, there's a sort of louder alarm toward the end. Uh, we could lose everything here, and. Uh, uh, I'm not going to ask. Well, I will eventually. I'm going to make ask you to make a prediction. But why do you think all this is happening? What's the cause of our turning away from merit? I'm sorry to be a broken record, but it is about race. That's that's what's going on. Uh, Americans came belatedly to a universal recognition of their appalling racial history, and they're very prone to guilt. And I think the elites are terrified that those academic skills and behavior gaps are not going to close. And so they're preemptively putting out there the only allowable explanation for gaps in racial disparities in representation as racism. 
uh, you know, it used to be in the 90s, it was possible to talk about black culture, inner city culture, and its pathologies. Sociologists like Elijah Anderson and Orlando Patterson wrote about the divide in inner cities between the good bourgeois people that were trying to live up to bourgeois norms and the the oppositional culture that was extremely self-defeating. They couldn't write those books today. You're not even allowed to talk about culture. Uh, it's all racism all the time. And uh, we saw this after the George Floyd incident death where every mainstream institution came out with these preposterous apologies for the racism of math, for the racism of chemistry, for the racism of law. Uh, and uh, again, making it very clear to anybody who might dissent from that and say there's other explanations which are more powerful, that those would not be allowed. Uh, so I, I fear that either unless people harden themselves to the charge of racism and say, I'm sorry, the preservation of civilization and, and high expectations, you know, if, if your exclusive concern is black well-being, you've got to realize that lowering standards is not the way to advance that well-being. Too many black leaders, I get sick of it. I periodically say, I'm not going to write about race any longer because it's too discouraging. I'm sick of it. I'm sick of hearing black leaders say lower standards on our behalf. They don't say we will meet and beat your standards, which is what Asians have done and Jews have done. To you know, you talk about your privilege of having teachers as parents. That is, and people who valued knowledge, that is privilege, and family privilege is our, which is part of what you're saying as well. That's our privilege today. It's not white privilege, it's family privilege. What needs to be explained, if we're such a white supremacist country, why do various Asian groups way outperform white Americans on income? And it's because they have cultures that value education. And until that starts happening in the black community, yes, we'll do the charters, we'll do the make it as widely available as possible, but it needs to be a joint effort. Yeah, I think uh, uh, um, uh, I'm going to pose a slightly different explanation than race. Okay. Uh, and mine's more sinister. It's hard to be more sinister than you. <laughs> So I'm going to make. I'm glad to find I can something to aspire to. Yeah, so I'm going to make another a run standard at it. to meet. So uh, misplaced sympathy about race is rampant. I agree, but it's also true that uh, go back to that to the orchestra and how you get into the orchestra. Nobody's powerful in that scenario. Uh, there's no act of will going on. A bunch of people try out. The best one gets picked. Now, the act of will is in the practice and the talent that they have. It's not, the talent is not will, but in the practice they've given to it, right? But the standards are objective, and that means that the conductor is not really even powerful in that, in that scenario. Now, same way true if you, you know, I have to decide. I don't do it, but I help. We have to decide who to let into Hillsdale College. Mm. There's a lot more applicants than we can take. Yep. How do we do it? We try to get the most willing and the most able. And we don't think that our preferences are particularly operative. Mm -hmm. For one reason, because if we don't get the most willing and the most able, since it's true that most of the work is in the student, then everybody will fail, including us down the road. So we're not powerful then, you see. Whereas if you can decide that this ancillary factor is the criteria, we're going to pick them by their color, even if color has little to do with it, with the performance of the job. If you say that, you become very powerful. And I think that might be what's going on. Well, that's a good explanation. And I would just say, as an aside, I wish I could 
disband every admissions office in the country. I hate these people. They are so self-important. You know, the, if you read the the uh, materials in the Harvard affirmative action case, SFFAV Harvard, and they had transcripts of the way these admin- admissions officers talked. And like at Harvard, they asked questions like, are you brave? Are you courageous? Are you sympathetic? Are you compassionate? My view is, come on, no 16-year-old is these things. Like, who are you to make that judgment? Are you brave? You tell me. Yeah, yeah, you yeah, know, yeah. And, and they believe they're these artistes crafting this little utopian community. I would get rid of all of it and go exclusively on the numbers. And if it results in an all-Asian college, so be it. You know, I want to value accomplishment and that's it. And and not have all this judgment. So I I agree that you let race in. That gives you more power. But I'm going to respectfully disagree. I still <laughs> think that the moment that we're in is a moment where every standard is being torn down because of race. And if there were not racial disparities, we would not be saying that the we're getting rid of grading in the medical licensing exam, the step one, we're getting rid of grading for that because it has a disparate impact on blacks because blacks do the most poorly. And we've decided we'd rather go blind and go pass fail than have disparate impact. The MCATs, the admissions tests to get into medical schools are under enormous pressure to be jettisoned because they have a disparate impact on blacks. China, meanwhile, and you know, you talk about suicide, self-suicide, China is finding its most talented math students and throwing everything it's got at them. It is it is accelerating their advance. And we are dismantling gifted and talented programs. California is saying we're not going to teach algebra two in the ninth grade because blacks don't do as well. We're going to defer our most gifted students and make them wait it out in the hope that blacks and Hispanics catch up. I, I'm sorry, I look around and the the sole unifying theme for this breakdown of meritocratic expectations is racial disparities. And if we didn't have those, I think we'd be perfectly happy to continue seeing that some groups are going to outperform others to to a certain extent. uh, And well, okay. So I, of course you're right. That is the climate that prevails, but it's also true wouldn't they invent something else? They do want to control. Why, why Why? has the number of administrators in the public schools since, 19, since 2000 grown by 92% mm-hmm. and the number of teachers by 8.5%? Why did they appoint all of them? And the answer is, don't they like to have a big body of people who control everything? And so, so yeah, my... Uh, you, you do a great service, in my opinion, taking on this issue at race, race because it's risky, and knowing your nature a bit, I think that's part of why you like it. But uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah, you've got you're pretty. Uh, it's not. I don't. No, no, I don't. I'm. I'm actually pretty risk averse. I think it's. I do it just because, again, the things that I love are are mm-hmm. under deep, deep mortal threat. That's it. So you're fighting for something, right? Yeah, which brings me back to where... But the power thing, I mean, I guess, yes, I mean, bureaucracy expands and it's given... I would say a lot of the college, the student services bureaucracy, which is ridiculous, a lot of that is because of racial preferences and dealing with students that are not doing well. And so we have to have a whole explanation for that, which is is systemic racism and we need first-generation counseling and all of that. But so I guess that's pervasive, but you could have said that True as well in the 1950s and 1960s before our racial awakening. So there's always been a desire of bureaucracies to expand their domain. Yeah. Uh, but but we're in a moment like the post George. This has been going on for a long time, but the post George Floyd moment, it's become a national psychosis. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's right. And and you know the progressives who started all this, in my opinion. They were very interested in engineering the society and in detail. They were not interested in racial disparities. No. They thought they were they thought they were they were racist. They thought that was natural. Right. So that conversion that you're talking of, latest peak of it after George Floyd, 
that has provided a whole new rationale. I agree. And it's hatred of a civilization deemed too white and male. Like white females are very, very guilty in this. They're a disaster. The feminization of the university, the fact that it's overwhelming, the, the Ivy Leagues now, 75% of them are led by female presidents. The bureaucracy is predominantly female. The student body is female. This is a real problem because on average, males and females are different. They have different attitudes towards rationality, risk-taking, entrepreneurship, and and their skills are differently distributed at the tail ends of the distribution. Uh, so the females are also filled with rage and hatred, and they are trying to tear things down. And the mob, the only thing the mob can do is destroy. It cannot build. It is tearing down statues. It is tearing down names. It is tearing down monuments because that's what they can do. And there is a thrill in destruction. Well, speaking from experience, I think you might be a pretty good college president. <laughs> <laughs> I'd be in, I'd want to be in the classroom learning from my faculty. Yeah. So, <laughs> Well, it's a, a delightful thing to talk with you, and I so am grateful for mutual. your career, and I urge everyone to read your books and get to know this woman if you can. She's remarkable. Oh, that is such an honor. Thank you so much, <laughs> Dr. Arn. It's a real privilege being with you. Thank you very much. <laughs> 